we're going to dig further to the science of nuclear energy and economics and that gas shortfall. We'll start with a man who might well be the most experienced nuclear engineer in Australia. Tony Irwin worked for British Energy for 30 years, operating and commissioning eight nuclear reactors. He came to Australia and was a reactor manager for the installation and operation of our own Opal reactor at Lucas Heights. Now he runs SMR Nuclear Technology, which consults on the development and the siting of small nuclear reactors. You know, it's the only reliable source that's independent of the weather. And looking at successful low emissions programs in other countries, they've all involved either large amounts of hydro or nuclear. These have been the successful ones. The ones that are not successful are the ones that have gone for very high renewables like Germany. So it's a surprise that we really haven't properly considered nuclear. It is the reality in Australia, though, we haven't ever had to consider nuclear because we've had so much coal. But as coal-fired power stations come out, yes, there is renewables, yes, they will be needed, but you've still got to have something as a baseload power. Yes. So in, in the 1970s, we, we looked at nuclear. We found brown coal. We built, built Hazelwood instead. You go fast forward to the 80s, Chernobyl, nobody's going to start a new nuclear power program in, in the 80s post Chernobyl. But then we get into a new situation where we've got this sort of demand for low emissions and the whole scenario is changing, but we've not changed with it. You know, we've stayed on the, the, the no nuclear path. Well, I know the interesting part about this is that Australia has a nuclear reactor at, Lu at Lucas Heights called the Opal Reactor, which creates much of the world's um, sort of uh, nuclear medicine. You ran that reactor. Yes. Again, we have a reactor here. So why the demonisation? So we started in 1958. We were one of the first nuclear nations. That high-far reactor was the first reactor in the Southern Hemisphere. Very successful, 50-year life. Now we've got Opal, the, the new one that's replaced it, provides all the nuclear medicines and silicon irradiation for the renewables industry um, and, lots of, and lots of research. So we're very used to nuclear. We've got a, a world-class nuclear regulator in our panzer. We've got a world-class safeguards agency in, in, in ASNO. We've got all the infrastructure. We're party to all the conventions. And yet, we're still not using it yet. OK, so, and we've also got much of the world's uranium. We export a third of the world's uranium. We are, I think, the second or third biggest uh, exporter of uranium in the world. But again, we don't use it. No. So we've got twice as much uranium as anywhere else in the world. We're the third biggest producer. It all goes abroad, and all these lucky countries use it to generate low emissions electricity. You know, the amount we, we actually export would, would actually cover in emissions all our, you know, all our electricity generation. All right, so <laughs> when you see the pricings from the government about nuclear is too expensive, the renewables are much cheaper, we should go down that front because economically that is the better way to go, what is the response to that? The problem is the GenCost report that CSIRO AMO produce every year. Now, to get the costings for that, they, they ask a consultancy, an expert, and they use Oricon. So Oricon do a really good job. They look at all the technologies worldwide and come up with the costings, except nuclear. So Oricon don't do nuclear. The last time that CSIRO asked for a nuclear cost for the GenCost report was 2018. GHD did that. Since that, all they've done is trying to cost escalate that every year. Until this year, and now this year they thought, really got you this year because there's a cancelled project in the US and they said, look, we've got real figures now we can use. But they haven't been able to interpret those because they didn't use any consultancy to do it. So the, the costs they've got are, are for SMR in particular are, are just, you know, ridiculous. All right, so we interviewed a few weeks ago the Energy Minister of Ontario. Now, he told us that not only are they going ahead with small modular reactors, which is a part of the plan of the coalition, but also they're able to get them in in quick 
time. And indeed, they're able to get them in with relative economy, even compared with the existing forms of energy that they're, they're, they're generating. Yeah. So is that more likely to be the real, rea the real life solution if we went down this path? Yes. So they're going to install the GE Hitachi BWX 300 at the Darlington site. This is Ontario power generation. They've applied for the construction license, they're preparing the site, should be operational by 2028. And, you know, it's a, it's a new type of reactor, but it's, it's based on the existing technology. So it's not a big unproven technology, it's a proven technology. We've been monitoring it for years and we're very, you know, happy with that technology. That would be very good. And, and where would that be best located in Australia if we were to take that technology? Well, I think the coalition plan's right. The best thing is to repower existing retiring coal-fired sites. You've got the transmission. So you've got big transmission already. One of the problems we see in renewables is this 28,000 kilometres of transmission we've got to build. Very, very difficult. You've got the rest of the infrastructure. So you've got cooling water supplies, some of the buildings, etc. But the most important is you've got the staff. So you've got skilled staff you retrain those for the nuclear power plant. Most of the, the, the plant actually on a nuclear power plant is the same as a coal plant. So it's got a turbine, you know, it's got compressors, pumps. If you're a turbine operator on a coal plant, you're a turbine operator on a nuclear plant. You know, there's no basic difference. So you can retrain the staff. That's what we did in the UK. That's what Bill Gates is doing in Wyoming in his project there. You know, and it, it then brings all these benefits to the community. So you get, you know, economic benefits, you get well-paid jobs, etc. One of the things in the, uh, the, the, the coalition paper is that there's a two and a half year programme of community engagement. And you need that. You know, we're getting sound grabs today saying no, yes. <laughs> not, not in my backyard, yes. as it were, yes. You know, because you've got to go through the whole process of consultation and you you can't impose it you know, it's got to be but it's got to be local people not people coming in from outside and telling the locals what what they should be thinking great to have you on the program today many thanks for your time thanks Ross